Welcome to my talk on building and operating cloud-native applications. A little bit about myself. I'm currently a developer advocate at Red Hat, focusing on Go, I'm sorry, Kubernetes and OpenShift, so I'm mainly working upstream in Kubernetes. Before that, I was an advocate at Mesosphere, also in container space, pretty much the same role. Before that, I was chief data engineer at MapR, another um, startup uh, in the Hadoop space when Hadoop was cool. And before that, I did deployed research in Austria and in Ireland. And nowadays, as I said, I'm mainly a gopher. Uh, I did do PHP around 2009, 2010, so <sighs> cut me some slack. I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know it, but I'm certainly not an expert. And I'm what I would call a developer turned ops person. So I started out 1997-ish uh, when Java was the cool kid, um, earning my money with, with developing stuff. And then like the last four or five years, uh, essentially when, when I got into containers, um, more on the operational side of things. So uh, this is essentially this dev and ops thing that you, you are aware of what the other side is doing. And that doesn't mean that I'm actually operating stuff. I'm just you know interested in and um, understand the language of operation folks. Quick show of hands. Who is an admin? Okay. SRE, Site Reliability Engineer. Okay. Developer? That's the majority. Yeah. yeah. QA? Good. Good for you. Architect? <laughs> Architect? Yeah, don't be shy. That, that's fine. Product or project management ish. Now comes the hard part, pointy hairy boss. No. Nope. Okay, so we are amongst <laughs> us technicians. Cool. All right. So obviously, we're going to start with the why, because the why is the main thing. Like, if you get that, if you get the, the underlying motivation, then the rest follows. The rest is really, really simple, and, and you will see that at the end of the day, the technology. It might be overwhelming at first, but it's not really the hard part. So why are we doing that? Why are we you know, bothering you know, cloud native and containers and all that jazz? At the end of the day, well, we want to outperform the competition. We want to ship features faster. You know, we, we live in this 24-7 everything at our fingertips, right? The, we get nervous if we, we can't buy something immediately or can't like that cat picture or whatever. And, and we demand, and business demands, that we actually ship fast and ship faster. And if we can ship faster than the competition, at least that's the theory, then bless you, then we, you know, we are better off. To me, that's not the most important thing, but I, I do understand that the business, the business needs drive a lot of, of that. Related to that, and, and as I said, it can be independent in terms of money, is ship around the clock, right? This old traditional way of throwing things over the fence, and you say like twice a year you're rolling out something new, um, turns into this many, many, many small batches, small feature updates. If you reload uh, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, whatever app you have, or, or web page you have there, um, pretty much every time you have a new version, Compare that with once a year a new C Does, do people still know what a CD is? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, okay, right. You might have had that, right? You, wow, <laughs> look at that new CD. I get an install a new version or, or discs before that floppy disks. Um, so that has changed, and and again, it might be business that drives that and demands it, or it might be um, some 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 other entity. But the, the tendency is really this ship around the clock whenever there is a new version. Uh, available, you potentially also want to ship it, and uh, the internet obviously makes that possible to actually distribute the data, uh, the, the software. And last but not least, to me at least, the most important one is this togetherness. Sometimes if you're paying a consultant, this is called DevOps, I always <laughs> ask them, how much DevOps do you want? Is it a kilogram or, you know, more? Uh, in reality, it's, re it's really all about that. And this is really the hard part, and you will see that at the end of the talk, I hope, that um, the technology, that's, you know, it's simple. Uh, most of that is open source. You can just grab it for free, you can use it. This is the hard part. Unfortunately, I don't really have good um, 
suggestions for that other than empathy and, and you know, learning the language of the other ones. In my experience, the ops folks are a little bit better than developers. They kind of like over the years, you know, they learn languages and they, they understand stuff. From the development side, we're kind of like, yeah, why do I need to know about monitoring and this and that? So maybe this is a kind of, uh, you know, encourage you to, to learn a bit from the ops side. So these, these three things, um, you know, outperforming the, the competition um, and, and shipping around the clock and, and the togetherness, these are the underlying, the whys, uh, why we are doing what we are doing here in terms of cloud native. Now we are moving on to something more um, tangible that so far might have been some, you know, Gartner or whatever high level pitch to CIOs. But now we're talking about the, the actual tenants of cloud native computing. And I came up with this uh, moniker, CRIP, whatever, AIA, automation, immutability, and APIs. What do I mean by that? Automation essentially means that uh, processes that have been manual steps are automated in, in a way like software, typically. Um, it means that we replace something that manual typically means it's brittle, it's error prone. People, you know, if I get up, if I get paged and need to fix something, you know, I might be hangoverish, I might, you know, might not have had the best time. And I, I you know, fat finger something and whoops, you know, the, there was a couple of years ago where someone at Google did that and whoops, half of the internet was gone. Like, and there's actually a Facebook study that showed that, that they have, as pretty much every, like the big ones have um, proper automated systems everywhere, that during the week the error rate is, I don't know, 5% or whatever at a certain level. And on weekend, sorry, other way around, on weekends the error level is, is relatively low and during the week it goes up. Why? Because people are there and people are doing stuff. So people are making these mix mistakes. Uh, I did that myself, so I, I know what I'm talking about. The, the original approach to that was uh, playbooks and, and fire drills. So you would have these are the steps and make sure, check against this is the expected outcome. And then every now and then you would have a fire drill. You would say, you know, assume this rack goes down and now let's see what we can do about that. It's a good step. It's a first step. And I had many discussions with people who said, playbooks, that's all we need, right? We only need these instructions and then all is good. I would argue let's, let's go a step further, and although I don't like the term agility, it's, it, it helps a lot uh, to automate things, all the things. Last but not least, consider the, the bus factor. That might not be a problem if you're in a big co you know, company or whatever, but you know, smaller environments, you might be a startup, you might be a contractor or whatever. What if that one guy or that one person <laughs> who knows you know, not, not only in terms of has access to something, but actually knows, oh yeah, this database, I, I first need to start that and then that. What if that person is not available anymore? It you know, moves on, the bus hits that person or whatever. Um, can you actually still keep it up? Can you um, somehow continue that operation? And there, obviously, automation uh, helps a lot. If you have any questions, don't be shy. I think we have microphones here. You can ask at any point in time, or we will have uh, 10 minutes at the end. But uh, just raise your hand, and a microphone will fly into your direction. Immutable infrastructure. Who does not know about pets versus cattle? Has not heard that term. Everyone? Few not? OK. So obviously, on the left-hand side, I think that's from the exactly. And on the other hand, you have cattle, right? So the basic idea there is we used to um, treat our infrastructure, our servers, or whatever, uh, very much like pets, right? And you kind of still see it sometimes where you know you enter www. I think IBM .com, and then you get redirected to www. Uh, to whatever. So you have this static partitioning. Um, and you know you have a front end that then redirects to a certain server or for databases or whatever. So you actually treat these machines as very, very, you know, as pets, as very specific. And if they get sick, if they, um, you know, there's a virus on it or whatever, then you know you take care of them and, and you know trying to to nurture them back to health. Versus cattle, um, well, 
they might not even have names. It's the cattle one, two, three, four, five, and if it gets sick, well, bad luck for you. <laughs> Next. Um, I'll come back to that later in the, in the context of stateful versus stateless, in the sense that for stateless stuff, if you have a web server, application server that doesn't have state, uh, that's pretty easy to achieve. If you have stateful stuff, then you sometimes actually have to resort to this uh, PADS approach. And databases are a prime example of that. I generally, if someone is not familiar with immutable infrastructure, uh, compare that with these mold figures, where you essentially, you know, you have something and you put something in and boom, that's it. You don't change it. You don't go there and carve something, whatever. That's not what you do, right? Um, the main question there is, um, in terms of operations against that infrastructure, is does it support idempotence? And that essentially means I can um, re do a certain operation over and over again and always get the same result, which, um, for example, my, my bank account is a, an example, a counter example, right? I can certainly not do that, or at some point in time I will get a nice letter from my bank. It, together with that, so if you have immutable infrastructure, if you have EDM potency, then you typically have increased reproducibility. And um, all these th three things together, pets versus cattle, wherever it's possible, item potency and, and increased reproducibility, horrible word, that essentially together more or less makes, makes this immutable infrastructure. Moving on to APIs. So this is kind of like, I, I don't know if it's self-explaining, but the, 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 sh the shift over the, the, the 10, 15 past years really moved to APIs and, and not implementation being the important bit. Some examples here, I used to work at MapR, and HDFS was essentially this, based on the, the Google paper, this uh, open source, publicly agreed upon interface, uh, the HDFS interface, so distributed file system. And the company I worked for created a proprietary closed source version of a distributed file system um, that was able to talk HDFS, and with that, essentially say it's a drop-in drop in replacement for the, this open source thing. Uh, GraphQL being another example, or Kubernetes API, which we'll have a, a look later on in greater detail. All of them, the, the examples all of, of them have the thing in common that you not necessarily care about implementation. You might pick one over the other because the one is more you know, performant or more resource efficient or whatever, but you care about the API, about the stability of the API. Um, is, it, you know, is it an open standard and so on? Any questions so far? <coughs> Makes sense? So APIs obviously help to decouple things. So you can, if you have a nicely defined API, you can decouple things and you can just um, yeah, use the API to integrate smaller bits. Already mentioned, to me at least, rather important that they don't necessarily always have to be community defined, but at least uh, they're considered open so people can suggest additions or, or um, there is some, some governance around that. It could be something more formal like IETF or W3C or uh, you know, one company that has enough uh, power to, to suggest that and, and push that through. <coughs> I personally like declarative APIs, so I'm not telling, you know, do this and do that, but this is the expected end result. Go off, do whatever you like to achieve that. And we'll come back again in Kubernetes to see that this is actually this declarative APIs and uh, essentially just saying this is the state I want to have is, is pretty, pretty central to, to Kubernetes and others. Okay, so we had the tenants now, which is already a step further to um, the, the actual meat of this talk. And now we're really talking about the the set of, of technologies, tools, and methods that uh, are cloud-native, that make up cloud-native. So there's this term cloud-native computing, and I'm going to attempt to define it in a moment. We're talking about containers and container orchestration, service me meshes and data meshes, and last but not least, a little bit more on the OPSI side of things, observability. So big question, what is cloud-native? Any any takers? What is cloud native? No? Food coma? No? Okay. So, 
There is a Linux Foundation um, called Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It was born uh, initially, essentially, to host uh, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes was a, or is a Google started uh, open source project, and they wanted to find a home for Kubernetes to, you know, make it neutral, a neutral home. And over the time, so we are now at around, I think, 14, 15 projects, depending, it, it changes pretty much every week, new projects join CNCF, but initially, as I said, it was, it was uh, really Kubernetes, and then over time, other, most of them, more or less on the infrastructure, OPSI side of things, monitoring, distributed tracing, Fluentd, like Logstash for routing uh, metrics and events, gRPC, a, a uh, RPC framework, and so on. So, like, you have many, many, many uh, more here with tests. <coughs> that's MySQL and Kubernetes just joined, I think, a week ago, whatever, service meshes, and so on. So you have many, many projects that essentially have their home in CNCF. Um, in contrast to Apache Software, do people know Apache Software Foundation, ASF? No. It's not necessarily an engineering community. It's more about um, the marketing side of things, events, um, conferences, being able to exchange uh, thoughts and so on. It has working groups and, and six and so on, but it's not about like in Apache Software Foundation where people come together and say, we're going to code on that and you know, we release something. Um, every, each and every of these projects is essentially required to come up with their own governance and most take that model from ASF, but you don't have to. You can you know, come up with whatever, roughly speaking. If you have any questions, by the way, or, or want to say how awful the talk was, hit me up on Twitter here. It's on each uh, slide at the bottom. Moving on, that is the current cloud native landscape that the CNCF put together. And as you can see, there are, well, you probably can't see it, but there are many, many things <laughs> going on. And these blue boxed things are already part of CNCF. And some of them are kind of earmarked. They might become, they might be invited. Uh, and that is version 1.1. And that, again, rapidly changes and, and gets updated. The point here is really, or the goal, more or less, to come up with a kind of a toolbox where for each of the layers here, for the cloud part, for provisioning, the runtime, and so on and so forth, uh, you have at least one, sometimes even two projects in CNCF that you, know, you can, can use for a certain use case. So you'd say, oh, I need a, a service mesh, so I might you know, choose Linkerd and or Envoy, for example. Some of them, like container orchestration, uh, there is there can only be one. There is only one. That's Kubernetes. But yeah, there there are examples where you have two or more. You know the old saying: it works on my desktop or on my laptop. The cloud native version might be it works on my Kubernetes cluster, whatever cluster you have. Although I tweeted that, I don't necessarily think that that is the greatest of the definitions, so let's have a look at, you know, wh where did it come from and, and you know, a, a more formal definition. So people might be aware of uh, things like, you know, what Sun did back in the 2000s and VMware, then AWS came up with EC2, Heroku, um, I heard that in the last couple of days a lot when working at the booth that Heroku seems to be uh, quite known. Then came out OpenStack, you had Cloud Foundry there in 2013, Docker, uh, essentially reinventing this this container and, and making it actually usable, the, the UX really well done. And then in 2015, the Cloud Native Foundation, communities in Cloud Native Foundation in it. So that, you know, and it, it inherits more or less from all of those uh, previous um, projects, products, ideas, uh, taking the best of, of all of them and combining them. Who knows about 12-factor apps? Okay, a few, so maybe a little background. So if you're interested in it, it's, it's a little data, it's still valid, but it's like not as important as it was when it came out. The Heroku folks essentially put together a number of, um, well, 12, that's why it's called 12 factors. Um, best practices, essentially describing <coughs> how they run their stuff and uh, things like, well, you know, you have a code base, you have a version control system where everything is there and you take stuff from there. You have explicit dependencies, configuration, explicit and separated from the code. Um, 
a number of things that some of them are kind of like, well, that, that's nowadays it's, it's not a big thing anymore. Um, and some of them, well, in, in modern setups, th there are a few more which I want to discuss with you in a moment. But this is a kind of good starting point. So if you're not familiar with 12 factor, it certainly makes sense. But keep in mind, it's kind of like six, seven, eight years old. So it's not necessarily, you know, it's a starting point. So beyond, and I'm pointing out here um, a work in progress that the CNCF currently does to define, to properly formally define cloud native, it's just a, a Google Docs, and you know, you're invited to go there and um, comment on that. It's, it's open to everyone. And I'm basing my definition or explanation on it, but it's, you know, as it is work in progress, you know, we might need to refine or update what, what's here in my slide. So one of the very defining characteristics, and that was certainly not the case for the 12 factor, because that was obviously written by the Heroku folks, which <laughs> did not really have portability between their environment and someone else's in mind. They wanted to have, obviously, people in their environment. Um, but that is essentially what, what things like Kubernetes give you. You, you know, start out on premises, and you want to move to AWS, or you might have different clouds there. And you want to have this portability. You want to have. You want to be able to move your workload from one environment to the other without being dependent on concrete uh, APIs of that cloud provider or OpenStack or whatever you're using. The question is then, what is the unit of deployment? So, for example, the things that you package up and ship and <coughs> that get launched are VMs or containers or functions. Very often, but. This is not like a hard requirement. We're dealing with distributed systems. If you think about microservices that potentially run on different nodes, you end up with a distributed system, right? So it, th this is not like th there are cloud native things that just simply run on one machine. This is not a hard requirement. But typically, you do end up with it, or eventually, you do end up with a distributed system. And one of the most probably interesting things for many people uh, is elasticity. So depending on the workload, so you need metrics, you need to know, you know what the traffic is or how, uh, how high the utilization is, it can scale. It can automatically scale, that can be on the application level, so having more instances of the same thing running, which is pretty easy to achieve when it's um, stateless. Or you're adding nodes, so you might start out with three nodes, so three VMs or whatever, and then you're provisioning, you're adding a new VM, which obviously takes longer than spinning up a container, but you know, you're extending your infrastructure as the workload goes up. Any questions so far regarding these four things? Because now we're going to go deeper, even deeper. Portability. One of the main things, and again, Kubernetes gives you that, is to avoid platform lock-in. So rather than um, coding against a specific AWS or Azure or Google Compute um, API, you're essentially well, you're locked into Kubernetes <laughs> if you want, but that al at least allows you to choose your, your underlying uh, platform then. It also enables hybrid cloud deployments, as I mentioned earlier on. Either, that's what I see quite often with customers, they start off um, in a test evaluation phase on premises and then move for the real workload into AWS, for example. And um, yeah, so that you can have both. You can have you know, a global load balancer that, depending on the type of user, it routes the traffic. But essentially, this um, really multi-cloud or hybrid cloud deployments is possible with it. The unit of deployment, as I said, traditionally, many years ago, sometimes still the case, you actually uh, think and, and work in terms of physical service. Nowadays, especially in cloud environments, you typically have the, the virtual machine. Um, increasingly containers, and some say that the future belongs to serverless or functions as a service. So the unit, that's, that's the thing that you as a developer kind of care of or, or have to be bothered with. So if it's functions as a service or serverless, as the old term was, then you just say, okay, this is my function, and I upload it somewhere, and magically this function will be executed. We get to that in a moment, but that's all you care. If your unit of deployment is a container, however, then you probably, you know, you will hear or you will be bothered with what is the base image, how do I get my, my PHP source code into that and build my container image, you're dealing with container registries, you need a container orchestrator, and so on. And VMs, yeah, so you, 
thinking and, and deploying in terms of this VM and this VM, and you somehow need to get the code there and so on. So VMs and containers, in a sense, uh, are very, very or rather similar in terms of this, this workflow and how ops and dev work together. Uh, functions uh, have a, a totally different <coughs> characteristics, especially the implications for um, developers. So, because there is no ops folks, I mean, there is always some ops folks, but probably not the ones that you know are in your team or in your company. Um, so, who gets paged? Who who uh, will fix some some broken uh, function? That's probably you if you're the developer. And uh, another remark regarding distributed systems. Um, the typical assumption is that whatever you're building there, whatever distributed system can scale out on commodity hardware. This is nowadays, it's kind of like, yeah, what else? Uh, some 15, 20 years ago, that was uh, a big thing. That actually led uh, Google to build things like Borg and, and uh, the Google file system and many, many other things because they said, well, we're not going to pay HPE or whatever big money for these big boxes. We're going to um, make our stuff run on commodity hardware. That doesn't mean cheap hardware. It just means, you know, commodity. It just you can buy it everywhere and can put it in. <coughs> and we just put many, many, many of the same boxes there and actually take care of the, um, the failover, the, the reliability and so on on the software layer. We are not, you know, trying to make the hardware and paying for hardware that is fault tolerant and whatever, we are doing that on the software layer. Nowadays, it's kind of like, yeah, I mean, who, does any one of you still have kind of like dedicated special hardware, which is not kind of commodity where you can buy it everywhere you want? Anyone? Yeah, you? You seem to be very special. <laughs> uh, there is the good old fallacies of distributed computing around 2004, can't remember. Uh, a guy from, from Sun put that together, seven or eight uh, fallacies, things like uh, the network uh, is not reliable, and so on and so forth. And that, that's, that is still true, and, and even more so um, in, in these setups where you have public cloud, and private, and so on. So read up on the fallacies if you don't know them. Um, together with this commodity hardware, there is one thing, and you might remember this wonderful term, NoSQL which was never really about SQL, but about the fact that relational databases were not inherently able to shard the data, right? And along came the uh, MongoDBs and the Cassandras and whatnot that essentially said, well, I, I can just shard, I can just chop up my data and distribute it on different nodes um, and still present a kind of logical unified view towards the, the end user. Uh, you can do, like nowadays with Galera or whatever, you can do that the same thing for relation databases. It was just back then, 10, 12 years ago, uh, just not, not there, out available in the open source. Finally, we move on to the containers and container orchestration. Container 101. What is a container? Any takers, any brave people, what is a container? Not, not, not the ship thing that the thing that runs on your computer. <coughs> yes? Isolating the environments processes? I take the processes, yes, yes, I take the processes. I slightly rephrase that and say it's really just a process group, technically, process on steroids. Taking a few of these uh, built-in Linux kernel um, concepts, namespaces, C groups, and copy and write file systems. And the, the big innovation, the big, you know, thank you for, for doing that, Docker, was essentially to make that usable. So containers existed for, for a long time. Um, you know, we had uh, Chirut, I don't know, 20 years ago, we had Solaris Zones, we had many LXC, we had many, many things, but they were mainly operation tools. So operators, administrators, they would know their way around. They would you know, be happily directly creating a C group and a namespace and enter that namespace and whatnot. And Docker made it as easy as a Docker run. Boom. Even my, my dad can do that. So really, I mean, don't bother with, with all the details here, but if you are interested in, I, I maintain this uh, containers info, this advocacy site, if you're really interested in what exactly is the pit namespace and what exactly is the C group X. Um, you typically, as a developer, you might you, you might have a reason why you want to you know 
control a certain C group or a namespace or whatever. Typically, you don't. It's, it's kind of hidden away. Uh, but it, it's nice to know. And so that's C groups um, version of hierarchy one. There is now a new one, version two, coming out. Uh, but again, that's, that's kind of like hidden away, wrapped away by, by Docker and, and others, that you don't need to bother about that. You just remember, a container is really nothing else than process or process group that leverages a few kernel features like namespaces, C groups, and copy and write file systems uh, to give you this ni nice experience. And what, what's the goal of a container? Why do we use containers? What, does, what problem does it solve? Blank stairs. Who has, who has done Docker Run? Who has ever done Docker Run? OK. Why did you do that? Because it's cool, right? No. Because <laughs> your boss told you? Like, wh why did you do that? What, what problem does it solve? OK. You again. Because the ability to uh, reliably reproduce the same environment. Yes. Yes. Excellent. I, I will, again, rephrase it slightly, but you, you hit the, the nail. Essentially, what containers really solve is just this application-level dependency management. Um, I don't know if that exists in PHP. Please educate me. I just know it from Python that it's called virtual env, where you essentially say, well, I need this specific version, so I'm going to create a virtual environment, and I can install whatever I, I want there. I don't pollute the global system. Does that exist in PHP? Is that a problem in PHP? No. PHP doesn't use versions. No. Ish. Okay. But that's, that's a problem, right? Because on my machine here, I might have version, help me out, 5 or whatever in production I use, or other way around. I have version PHP 7 here, and in production I have 5, whatever. And, you know, it works on my machine when I deploy it there, and it doesn't work, and, you know, you're sad, and the administrator is sad, and yells at you, and you go like, shrug. So that's what containers do. They make sure that all the application level dependencies are packaged up, so you know that shit that works in your machine is exactly the same that works or breaks in production. But at least you know what it is, right? So you don't need to, like, oh, can I quickly SSH into that box? And like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't got that SSH access, right? The administrator says, no, no, no. Um, so it's reproducible, right? It's about environments, language-specific environments. And and it solves this packaging problem on a generic level, not on a per language level, but on a generic level. So you say, I want to uh, base this on this version of PHP, let's say 5.6 or whatever it is. Um, and by creating this container image, which at the end of the day uses these copy and write file systems, layers them, packages them up, slaps some metadata on top of it, um, you can run it locally. You can say Docker run, boom, and it works. And then you put that into registry and someone pulls it from there and can deploy it and has the guarantee that it's exactly the same environment. That's the kind of dream that we always had, right? Development, QA, whatever, production always looks the same. Voila, we have solved that problem. Almost. Container orchestration. Container orchestration is like, OK, I've solved that problem running a single container on a machine, which is, you know, Docker run. But what about if I have microservices or I have multiple things that you know, look identically, like replicas, or I want to shard something, or whatever. So more containers on more than one node. Well, I need something that does this orchestration thing. Orchestration is really a very fluffy term that spans typically these things. So you're talking about scheduling. I need to decide, well, this container here, I'm going to put it, I'm going to launch it on this node. And then if I want to connect to it, then I somehow need to remember, ah, yeah, this container is on that node. So, you know, if traffic comes in, I'm going to route it to this node. Who did that so far without containers and container orchestrators? Or how did we do that? If you're not in operations, you probably don't know, but, you know, you, had, you maybe had a spreadsheet, right? This application runs on this node. So if someone asks it, well, you know, you have to connect to this node on this port in order to talk with that application. So there was a container or an application or whatever orchestrator. It just was not very automated. Later on, there were other approaches, you know, using Chef and Puppet in the first generation. There was Fleet from Chorus. Um, you can do shell scripts. Whenever you find yourself that you're reinventing the wheel, there's something else that actually does it. Maybe don't do it. Maybe use that thing that actually was written for that by people who know what they're doing. Uh, you have 
some kind of organizational primitives. Uh, I used to work at, at Mesosphere. With Mesos, there were, were these kind of like static, or marathon really, these static constructs called groups. In, uh, and later on, labels were, were introduced. In communities, we're, we're organizing things with labels. So we're labeling stuff, saying like, this thing here, this pod or whatever, this is something that runs in production or in dev, or it belongs to this organization, or it has been created by this author or whatever. So we just slap labels on things, and then we can filter by that. We can you know, do set-based operations. We say, I want to see all parts that Michael created uh, in this namespace, in this uh, environment, in, you know, that are five days old. Well, most parts are not, but scaling. That's one of the things we already mentioned earlier on. Um, upgrades, so you can do rolling upgrades. You can do blue-green deployments. You can do AB uh, deployments. Service discovery, which is kind of like the price you're paying for this automatic scheduling. That's this kind of lookup thing where you say, well, I don't really know where this container runs, so I need to have some system that tells me to which actual VM or whatever hosts that container I need to connect to. Health checks or probes, as we call them in, in uh, Kubernetes, essentially, if you provide certain mechanism that the container orchestrator can check how your application is doing, then certain things can be automated. For example, you could say, well, I'm going to hit the root, I'm going to, you know, your application, HTTP, uh, the root, and if I get a 200, I consider this application runs, right, or is, is healthy. Um, or you could have some database application where I need to connect via TCP, and if I, you know, can connect, then, yeah, I consider it, it, it healthy. And based on that information, uh, either, um, yeah, some, some kind of thing that looks after services, routing traffic, or some local supervisor that decides when to restart a container can just automatically do things that typically used to be done by humans that would look, would poke the application, say, oh, that looks dead, I think I'm going to restart that. Any questions here? It's a lot, quite a lot of information, but just on a very high level, that's what a container orchestrator, if, if, you, if you're buying into a container orchestrator and it only does one thing, then it's probably not a container orchestrator, but a scheduler or whatever else. So what do we use? What's the standard? That's very simple. As of 2018, it's Kubernetes. So the container orchestration wars are over. Kubernetes has, has won. Essentially, it takes care of this container lifecycle management. Uh, you define, you say, here I have a stateless, long-running workload. And you know Kubernetes takes care of all that. On the right-hand side, you see a typical uh, setup with all the details. You don't really see it, but once you get the slides. Um, that has components up there, that's the control plane. There are a few things in there, the API server, which is kind of like the brain, everything talks with the API server, which is stateless. Pretty much all of that is stateless besides etcd, which is a distributed um, key value store where everything, the entire cluster state is, uh, is captured. So if you launch a pod there, then you know there will be an entry in etcd that says this pod or th on this node there is a pod running that belongs to this deployment, for example. And then you have all these nodes, in our case three, th those are the worker nodes that actually carry out the work, and there are again a few uh, things there that Kubernetes needs. It's the, uh, the kubelet, it's kind of like the supervisor for the, the runtime. You have kubeproxy, uh, and then the actual runtime, which nowadays still the default is uh, Docker, but there are alternatives like cryo that start to replace Docker there. So at the end of the day, if you are you know, on your machine, you would say Docker Run or Docker PS or whatever. Uh, so as an admin, you typically, as a developer, you don't get there. But as an admin, you would SSH into node one, and you could actually say Docker PS, and you would see all the pods, uh, all the containers that run, that run there. And uh, Kubernetes just adds another abstraction on top of containers, so-called pods, which mainly are useful for um, local uh, locality, for, for um, strong coupling. As I mentioned early on, very, very important um, characteristics of API. The whole thing in Kubernetes is declarative. So you just say, this is the state that I want to have. For example, I want to have three um, instances or replicas of Nginx running. Take care of it. I don't care how you do it. Just make, make sure the three are running. And then you know something might happen to node three, you know, power outage in that rack or whatever. And then something, it's called a controller, that just uh, 
runs in a loop, and that's the state-driven part, looks at it and says, oh, user set three, and you know, this node is gone, so that pod is gone. Oh, I need to spin up another pod somewhere else. Right? So you, as a user, don't care about how Kubernetes manages that. You just say, I want three. Go ahead, you know, make it so. Kubernetes is super extensible, and that's also very scary because there are so many moving parts. Even I or others who work upstream, who work in Kubernetes, don't typically know all of the extension points because depending on where you look, you can write plugins for the, the for kubectl, you can write plugins for that, you can exchange the runtime, you can exchange uh, different types of storage, networking layer, everywhere. You can um, extend the, the objects or resources that um, that uh, the API server understands, you can so, uh, define so-called custom resources. Like, you can extend it in every direction. That's scary, that's a good thing, but that's scary. So typically what people do is, uh, that's the reason why people like myself uh, have a job, is they, you know, rather than rolling their own Kubernetes distribution, they, they take a, an existing Kubernetes distribution, like, like OpenShift, the stuff that I'm gonna show you later on. And yeah, last but not least, all of that is built with this idea of being very robust and, and, um, and scalable. So each of the parts um, you know, can just die and can come up again and continue to work. And many of those, we typically seen 1,000, 2,000 node clusters, uh, tens of thousands of services that's still um, you know, doable with, without bending yourself over backwards. You can just do that with the vanilla setups there. Any questions so far? Because now we are getting into a little bit more inspirational things, things that exist but not necessarily are production ready yet. Let's put it that way. Service meshes. Who has heard about service meshes or a service mesh? One, two, of course you. Two, three, okay. So three people out of, I don't know, 40, 50, 60. Um, the basic idea is essentially the same as with Kubernetes where you say, well, you know, if you find yourself doing certain things ad hoc on, you know, with shell scripts or whatever, um, maybe this is a good time to actually use something that actually was designed for that. And in, in the case of service meshes, it's really about the communication between different entities, in this case, pods uh, in, within Kubernetes. Istio is, is generic, or you can use or should be able to use uh, it with, with others as well, but it focuses for now on, on Kubernetes. So forget about all these labels there. At the end of the day, what you want to say is, if I have something, an application in Kubernetes running here and something running there, um, this one is allowed to talk to this one, but not the other way around. Or uh, you want to inject uh, some failure, and you want to make sure that the connection um, is secure via TLS, for example. So it's about traffic management. Uh, you get for free. You get uh, monitoring and tracing. So rather than pushing that into the developers, ha has ev anyone ever been asked to instrument their code? Do people actually know what instrumenting their code is? No, lucky you. So really, it's about well, you know, we we need to get some insight into what's going on into your application. So please provide an endpoint that gives us certain metrics, and um, that uh, the the service message. Meshes essentially solve that problem. They take care of that outside of the application. You can have policy enforcement, uh, as I said early on, and uh, it provides each of these players with an identity and, and uh, enables security there. And the most important thing, as I said, it just runs with the code itself. You don't need to change the code. All of these things are automatically injected through uh, sidecars, sidecar pattern. Data meshes, essentially the same idea applied to data, and the problem we're solving is essentially this one, um, which is not unknown or uncommon. Uh, the product here launched very, very recently, actually a UK-based uh, company called, uh, well, the company is called differently, but the product is called Dot Mesh, and essentially allows you to capture the state, think databases, data stores, uh, across different microservices operates on the file system level, and um, you, it kind of like externalizes the snapshotting in the same way that service meshes uh, externalize uh, this metrics issue uh, for you. So you don't need to do that in your application. You just say, oh, I'm running Elasticsearch, MongoDB, 
MySQL database, and you can just snapshot that and then compare that um, and, and aggregate that as well. And it really helps you in terms of, you know, what happened there? Well, you can go through all the logs and trying to figure out what happened, or you can actually look at that snapshot and say, ah, okay, I see. That was the state of, let's say, the dat database table at that point in time, and that's the diff here. So, ah, okay. So if, you, if you're familiar with Git and that Git interface, Git commit and so on, in terms of UX, it has essentially that interface uh, with slightly different semantics and, as I said, targeted uh, focusing on, on data stores, databases. If you're interested in that, I interviewed Luke Marston, of the CEO of that company, uh, last week, and uh, you can you can watch that video on, on YouTube. Last but not least, and then we're getting finally to the demo, is observability, and that is a very very obsy uh, topic, but you should at least be aware of it, what it means in the context of containers. Um, you want to be able to monitor not only the host, the, the box where containers run, <coughs> but actually each and every individual container or pod. And that means that the traditional way of doing monitoring does not really work, so you need to be able to, because containers come and go, right? They might only run for 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Some of them run longer, but it's not the, the, the same way that, you know, a VM weeks and, and uh, potentially month, but, you know, in terms of, yeah, it could be seconds. So you need to be fast, you need to be immediately available to, to grab the metrics, uh, to aggregate stuff across different nodes, uh, same for monitoring and logging, and distributed tracing. If you think about when you open up developer mode in your browser, that thing that you see down there, this call graph, that's the same thing for a cluster or for microservices. So you see, oh, you know, it first went through this microservice and then it spent 500 milliseconds in that one and so on. So you, can, you get an idea where is the bottleneck, you see what you can optimize, you can use it for for troubleshooting, so essentially the same idea that you have in your browser. Do people know what I mean, this waterfall thing there? Yeah, the same thing for a distributed system. That's distributed tracing, this little fellow here, the Jaeger project. There's the standard behind that, open, open tracing, uh, and Jaeger being one of, of these products. Prometheus being this monitoring, in Kubernetes it's the standard nowadays, and one example, a very popular one for logging, for logging aggregation being this either EFK or ELK, ELK stack, uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and or uh, FluentD, or FluentD and Kibana as the front end where you can actually query uh, logs across different uh, containers. Now, I was lying a bit. There's one last section before we get to the demo, how I'm doing time-wise. Okay. Okay. Um, the, I, I believe what most people do currently is looks pretty much like that. You take your code, configuration, credentials. You run that, uh, put that into code repo and have probably, hopefully, a CACD pipeline. And at the end of the day, you create a binary or scripts or whatever that you deploy on either bare metal or VM. That's kind of like, who, who is doing something like that? Some. And the others, you, you ship it via floppy disks, or how do you get your <laughs> stuff out? Okay, cool. So that's the, what I would then call the cloud native way. You still have code configuration and credentials, that's the same, but then you also have this container image uh, manifest, your Docker file. You have the container runtime manifest, for example, uh, uh, in Kubernetes, uh, a YAML manifest where you say, this is a deployment, it has three replicas, use this container image, uh, expose that port, and so on, or Docker compose, or whatever you have there. A service mesh manifest that defines policies and, and so on. And then you take that and put that again into <coughs> a repository. You run it through a CICD pipeline. And then now you have this new blue, bluish being more on the dev side, greenish more on the, on the up side. You have this container registry where at least these artifacts, the container images, the application container images are stored and which then get pulled by the container orchestrator and or service mesh to actually deploy a container and run it. So this, this handoff now, um, you know, it might have been something you used before, like Artifactory or whatever, but now without a container registry, you cannot use containers, right? You need some container registry. Uh, people typically start with Docker Hub, and if you're more towards production, you have your own container registry there. 
And if you look at the artifacts that we are dealing with and or producing and the respective tooling, it looks a bit like that. Core, again, we always start with the code, the configuration, which again, already due to the 12 factors, best practices is separate from the code. It's not you know, hard coded in there. Uh, and the credentials you potentially have, so things like this is the database password, this is an API key for some AWS API or whatever. Um, the corresponding thing here is the, the, the code repository and the CICD pipeline. Same for container uh, image manifest would be the container registry, the <coughs> runtime manifest would be the container orchestrator, and the service, if, if you're there, the service mesh manifest would be consumed and, and uh, worked on by the service mesh. And as you can see, it grows from inside out. So the tip here is, if you are here, right, that means you have a Docker file and have done Docker run on your machine, right? Go from inside out. Don't start with the service mesh. And many, yeah, well, you might be laughing, but many people come like, oh, Michael, I want to benefit from containers. And I think I, su I should also do some service mesh. Said, mm, no. The thing is, if you don't have your act together and have sorted out the CICD pipeline, there is no point in hell that you're benefiting from service mesh. You need to do your homework, have your source code in you know, Git or whatever you have it, have a CICD pipeline that works, and then you can move on to something like worrying about, okay, this, this should be in a container registry, that should be secure, should be scanned, yada, yada, yada. And then you worry about, well, actually, I might need a container orchestrator. And rather than you know, having a bunch of shell scripts, you probably want to use Kubernetes or any other container orchestrator. I, I use Kubernetes. And again, if you're hitting, if you have more than five or 10 uh, microservices and you find yourself implementing these policies and all these things uh, by hand, you probably you're ripe for, for a service mesh. You go like, actually, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'll let the service mesh handle that. But it's really this maturity model from inside out, not the other way. Don't start with service meshes or container orchestrators. And one last thing before we finally get to the demo. <laughs> I promise. Um, so if you have a cluster, then you have <coughs> something that is local, so that might be your machine, and something that is, for example, in the cloud or somewhere else. So you have local and remote. One way would be pure offline, which means that both the development, development environment, your IDE, whatever, and the cluster is on your local machine. Another way would be proxy, which means that the cluster, you somehow get the traffic, network traffic off the cluster onto your local machine. And that means that you know, if you're calling out to another microservices from your machine, it looks like it's, it's you know, running on your machine. It's actually running a cluster, but it's proxy. Then the live thing, you, you actually have this, this separation of those, and then the only way to get stuff in there is putting, you know, going through the CICD pipeline and putting something in the registry. Um, or pure online environments, there are a couple of them where, you, where everything, even the development environment, essentially lives in your browser. Everything is in the cloud. Uh, that's great if you're always online. And just to give you an idea, there are you know, plenty of uh, tools that you can use from, you know, you might have installed the community edition of Docker for Mac or Windows, but there are many, many others that you can use. All have, you know, limitations or pros and cons. <coughs> some of them are more for proxy, some of them are more for local development, but there are many, many uh, tools that help you to develop in and with containers in a yeah, microservice distributed setup. Oh, there is still something there, function as a service. We already talked about it. The new name of function of, of serverless is fast. So you have some triggers that could be, f you know, upload something has been uploaded to S3 uh, or time or whatever the trigger is. And as a, a developer, you just provide that um, function and that does something. It's stateless. It's short uh, lived. And the main point being that you can integrate because it's stateless. You need to manage the state outside. So you know, integration in a database, message queue, or whatever. And again. The CNCF provides some, some guidance there where we currently are. This is really new. I think it has been released yesterday or so. Finally, demo. So how much more time do I have? Five minutes? Ooh, I've been talking too long. Oh, sorry. All right, very quick demo. I'm going to deploy a production-ready um, containerized microservices. Did I miss any password here? In less than five minutes. That should, that should be doable. Who thinks that's doable? Yes. OK, good. Let's see. 
Um, I'm gonna leave everything here actually like it is. I'm not gonna change anything. Let's see what happens. Oh, I need to provide a name there, right? Blah, 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 what's missing here? Da, da, da. Anything missing? No, fine, fine, fine. Oh, I need to say that it's a new project. So we create a new project. Uh, whatever, test, I don't care. Okay, now, I'm just using the defaults everywhere. Oh, really, <laughs> is it? <laughs> it's a global, like I'm using uh, OpenShift Online, which is a global system. It's like you know, Google and many others with the buckets or S3 buckets, they need to be unique. And test is <laughs> probably someone else had that idea already. So what it does now is, and we can have a look at that, test PHP cons. The first thing, if you remember these, these steps, it creates a build pipeline. That could be Jenkins somewhere else, but we're just using here the, the build-in stuff. So we say, here is our source code. Please uh, you know, pull it from this GitHub repo here. I don't know if you can see that. Right? That's where the source code lives. It will then build it, and everything here is done in that, that pod. It will then build it you know, with all the de dependencies here, whatever it has, cake, testing, blah, 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 blah. At some point in time, it will be done, and then it will create a container image based on this base image that I used here, PHP 7. You should see these layers very soon um, being built. One, two, that's the same thing if you do Docker build on, on your local machine. So your layers are built. It will push it to the built-in container registry, so you can use an external one if you want, but in our case, the defaults, it just pushes it to the OpenShift internal registry, and then it will say, well, I'm done building that. Uh, how about we deploy that? Almost there, and then it will kick off the deployment, and at the end of the day, you will have a deployment, which is uh, by default one replica of that uh, stateless stuff running, and an endpoint that I can directly use. So you can, once you see that, you can directly go there and, and uh, try it out. So push successful means I've done the container. This, this build is done. Just checking here, complete, cool. So I expect to see a deployment here, yes. In this case, it's both the stateless and the stateful through MySQL running, great. So I should now see that. And that's the URL, not ready yet, okay, okay. Okay, still says recreate deployment. Okay, come on, let's view the events. What's going on? Mounted everything. Okay, almost there. Started. Yay! Come on, come on, Todd, come up. So, currently, let's see. Okay, takes a little bit until everything is there. Health checks kicking in. Very nice. Okay. And it's running. Boom. So that was how hard it was to um, build from scratch an application, deploy it, and that is production ready. This is something, and I, I mean it, this is really, it has everything built in. It has, you know, I can look here, um, <coughs> metrics, I can look at the logs if I want to, um, of a single one or here, boom, you have Kibana there if you want. You can have log aggregation about all your pods if you want to. So this is really end-to-end -end, um, production-ready container orchestration based on the, the things that we discussed early on, build tools and so on, uh, at your fingertips. It's open source, you can just download it and install it um, and enjoy it. So it looks like that the, the question section will be very, very short, but I'm almost done here. Challenges. It's really fast moving, so you want to ask people like myself or my colleagues or from other companies for a bit of guidance. Observability is pretty key. We haven't talked about security. In our case, it's built in. Sometimes you need to take care of that yourself. But most importantly, and that's something where I can't directly help, I'm not a psychologist, it's about organizations. So tooling is the easy part, right? You can do it, you can grab it, but it's really about the organizations. A few resources you can study in your own time if you want to. And if you want to try out OpenShift, go to learn.openshift.com, free environment, and you can try it out.